Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to this special session at the next Einstein Forum, where we will be discussing addressing misinformation on research outcomes regarding infection projections and control. My name is Gameli Ajaho. I am with One Giant Lab, uh, which is a digital platform and community which is working on empowering people around the world to solve problems using open science and open innovation. And I'm here with our panelist, Dr. Samuel Fosu JC, who is the head of basic and applied biology at University of Energy and um, Natural Resources. Um, it's going to be a very interesting uh, discussion, uh, which will be exploring exactly how information is created and communicated when it comes to infection projections and control worldwide. And within the context of the current COVID-19 pandemic, what are some of the key issues that have emerged as far as communications around infection projections and control are? What have been our experiences here in Africa? And how can we improve really on communicating on this key topic with different publics? So um, Samuel, uh, welcome to this session. Thank you very much, Namali. Yeah, and um, my first question um, to you is that what has been the experience um, you've had in terms of the COVID-19 um, pandemic, like in general, um, as in like your experiences in Ghana? So like you rightly said, my name is Dr. Samuel Fosujesi. I am the head of the department, Basic and Applied Biology, University of Energy and Natural Resources. By training, I am a microbiologist and I also have a background in global health. By virtue of my training, ever since COVID-19 emerged at the later part of 2019, I have been involved in various advocacy, speaking on radio, trying to advise people, trying to predict the direction of the infection, and how people can feel safe. So by introduction, that is what I do. And I believe this session this afternoon is going to be a very interesting one. Normally, are you there? Yes, thank you, yes, yeah. thank you very much for your um, input. What would you uh, what would you identify to be like some of the key issues um, that have emerged in terms of misinformation um, around COVID-19, specifically in the Ghanaian context? Okay, so for the purpose of this presentation, Gamalin, you, you permit me to speak as a microbiologist. I want to believe that COVID-19 has been with us for a long time, and we speak as scientists. So you just give me the opportunity to throw some background light on this pandemic and where we are heading towards. Somewhere in December 2019, there was an outbreak of a pneumonia-like infection caused by SARS-CoV-2 virus. So now we hear that a lot of people have been affected. Now, globally, we can say that we have large proportion of the people who have been infected with the disease, largely in the Americans, Europe, and some extent, Africa. How can one get infected? We know that one can get infected with COVID-19 when an infected person comes close to a healthy person who is not wearing a mask or not wearing any protective clothing. And so when the infected person who is showing clinical symptoms of the disease, as in coughing, showing high temperature, sneezing, feeling malaise, the virus can easily enter into the unprotected person through the nostrils or the mouth, where the virus quickly moves to the lower respiratory tract. At the lower respiratory tract, the virus will try to attach itself to the cells using AC, AC simply means angiotensin-converting enzyme 2. They act as receptors. So when these receptors are around, 
the barrels are able to attack the lower respiratory tract where they enter the cells and then they uncoil and then they try to command the cells of the lower respiratory tract to behave as the COVID cells so they can multiply in numbers. Then they quickly assemble and then they move into the bloodstream and there an individual begin to exhibit clinical symptoms of the disease. We predicted that COVID-19 was going to be an issue. And so to be able to live with it, one has to really understand the dynamics of this pandemic. So even before time, we predicted that, you know, the infection was going to go high. I remember somewhere on the 12th of March, Ghana reported this first case of COVID-19. Two of them, within a short time, the numbers has increased. So I remember during that time, the government of Ghana today instructed that we go into lockdown. Gamale, when there is a lockdown, this is what scientists and public health experts try to do. We try to slow down the rate of infection so scientists can go after the virus. They have to do contact tracing, test. Once positive patients are picked, they are isolated, treated, and then they are allowed to go into the population. So we estimated that once the restrictions were being removed, because you can't also keep people locked down forever. When people are locked down forever, there are issues like psychosocial hazards that setting people feel like they've been locked for a long time, they really want to come out. But then in opening up, we also realize that we are also going to increase the rate of mixing. Then there is a problem on our hand. And so we also predicted that once mixing was going to take place, there are going to be some group of people who would be infected. So for every 100 people that we have picking the infection, we predicted, we predicted that between 90 to 92 percent of these people will be asymptomatic. However, there are two to three percent who will be critically ill, and these people would need much attention. All this has come to pass. So we 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 are saying that you know COVID-19 is a real issue, but then there was an issue that I wanted to really to talk about. I don't know whether. Um, I have time to speak on that because um, when COVID-19 came at first, there were predictions that Africa was going to the worst hit society. But unfortunately, we are not seeing that. And I'll tell you why. You know, a pandemic of every proportion, like the one we have in COVID-19, has serious ramifications in terms of death rate. And so Africa didn't really suffer the cruel effect of COVID-19 as it was expected because of the more reason. And the first one was our sociocultural practices. You know, growing up in Africa, many of us were fond of growing and playing in the sun. So as we play in the sun, we inadvertently were exposed to some viruses and then we healed when we built some form of immunity. Then also in most of some African countries, especially Ghana, there is the EPI. EPI is simply the expanded program of immunization. So with the EPI, you realize that majority of the people right from birth are giving immunization. And so they are giving protection to fight against diseases. And then there is also the repeated exposure of malaria episodes that also are common in African children. So we were of the view that although the disease was ravaging in Europe and in US, Africa was not going to be hard hit as expected. And these were some of the reasons. Now, you remember during my earlier speech, I made mention of angiostein converting enzyme 2. That normally would act as a receptor for attachment of the virus into the host cells once one is infected. African is blessed, especially West Africa, is blessed with vast amounts of sunshine. In this sunshine are also large amounts of vitamin D. Research has also shown that with large amount of sunshine, vitamin D is being synthesized in the body. And this vitamin D also acts 
to, as it were, block the efficacy of the attachment of these angiostatin converting enzymes, thereby slowing down the rate of infection. And then lastly, at the heart, China, where the pandemic started, were able to bring the disease under control because they have strict culture of adherence. I've been to China on a number of occasions. In China, adherence to regulations are very strict. And so when they are asked to stay indoors, hardly will you find people coming up. But the same cannot be said of Europe and US. At a point, because of the influence of even social media, some people were even thinking the virus was a hoax. Some were, you know, giving all sort of propaganda and theories to mean that COVID-19 was a hoax. It was not real. That is how come as we speak now, COVID-19 has killed a whooping 430,000 individuals in US and a similar number in that of Europe. But the same cannot be said of most of the African countries, especially those around the West African subregion. Mm. Thank you very much uh, for your inputs. Um, uh, you've actually raised a lot of uh, key issues that we'll be exploring uh, during the course of uh, the discussion. Um, we'll see how we can really get all the scientific information that you've given us to um, ordinary people in, in plain language. We'll also explore the role of social media as far as um, infections are concerned. I would like to invite, I would like to welcome a new participant to our conversation, Dr. Betty Kivumbi. She's a senior lecturer at the Department of Mathematics from um, Makare University. Dr. Kivumbi, we are discussing addressing misinformation on research outcomes regarding infection projections and control. And as you are fully aware, models are very important. Um, uh, mathematical models are very important as far as being able to make projections on various phenomena such as uh, infections. And um, my question to you, um, even as you begin to make your first input statement into this discussion is that, can Africa actually develop its own model that fits our context as far as this topic of infection projections are concerned? Uh, uh, yes, and I'm act actually actively involved in that in Uganda, and we have a model on misinformation and uh, its effect on COVID. Uh, which we have since uh, shared on uh, on preprint, uh, pre but uh, I could uh, you could uh, try to look at it. But we use the mathematical model to determine how an infodemic could affect uh, outcome of an epidemic, and it it had some good recommendations that the government made it to try and cut down on the misinformation that was circulating within the country, that even led to people not following the mitigation measures that were being set up. So yes, there are, there are lots of models of misinformation and COVID. Okay, so my, my, my next follow-up um, question for you is that, you know, in order to, for these models um, to work effectively, we need um, data to go into these models. So um, is there enough data for African scientists to make projections on disease outbreaks and also in order for them to advise on preventive measures in the future? Uh, yes, the data is there. It might not be as um, organized or as uh, well uh, collected as in developed countries, but the data is there and you can uh, effectively use it to make informed decisions. You can do a lot of data-driven research on the African data. And for COVID, all countries have been uh, very, very organized. So I, I believe that... Um, you can get good, good, good recommendations and results and outcomes or outputs from uh, the current data that is available. And for all countries, I know they've done a very good job, especially concerning COVID. So yes, the data is available. And if it's for a different disease, there are so many other uh, databases where you can get a good data. Very well. Thank you very much. Um, Okay, um, I have another question for Dr. Samuel uh, Fusu JC. Dr. JC, um, across the continent, when we are having the issue of um, um, COVID-19, um, one of the things that emerged was how do we deal with the uh, infection with our own like kind of like African solutions? And um, 
we we've had the opportunity um we've had the opportunity for research groups across the continent to do a lot of research around for example how does the the genome of the virus evolve but we haven't had as much um research information around like treatment or vaccinations for example do you think that um do you think that something can be done in terms of getting governments to like um, increase their investments in some of these other aspects uh, is there something is there a connection with um, understanding um is there is there is there a connection is there an issue with um science scientists or science people trying to like sell um you know their their, their output or their, their capacity with um, coming up with solutions is there an issue with that that they can actually communicate or sell better to to the various governments and funders well if i understood you very well we are trying to ask whether in our fight against the COVID-19 pandemic, scientists have been able to come together to be able to liaise with governmental institutions in the fight against infection. Is that correct? Correct, yeah. Yeah, then if that is so, then I would say a big yes. You know, when it comes to capacity in terms of research output, Africa has never lacked the human capital. But our main bane or our main challenge has been the support by financial institutions. I want to believe that you were aware that when COVID came within the early stages, some institutions in Nigeria and even our country were able to sequence the genome, which means that in terms of the human capacity, we have them. But when you're talking about vaccine development, it's a huge financial investment. Don't forget, we cannot reinvent the wheel, meaning that some institutions have been ahead of us and they are in the process or the business of trying to find a vaccine. And as we speak, I want to believe you are aware that there are a series of trials or clinical trials beyond maybe phase two and phase three that is currently going on. In terms of the collaboration and teamwork, I think there are teamwork that have been formed already. Whatever needs to do in terms of research, people are doing them. But like I said, the will of our governmental institutions to pump in huge sums of money to conduct research, AMAS, drug discovery, and even vaccines has always been a challenge. So going forward, what we need to do, we need to use innovative means. Currently, some institutions in Africa are trying to partner some northern institutions in the north-south collaboration model to make sure they can write proposals and look for funding. It is my dream that some of these will be successful because if they are, then we can make inroads. Talking about data, Africa has never lacked data. The success story of Ghana in its fight against COVID-19 was its ability to test, 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 and test. So it means they were able to invest much in diagnostics. So when they are testing, it is data that we are harvesting. From this data, then there must be the use of scientific wherewithal, backed by resources, to be able to conduct cutting edge research and be able to provide solution in this direction. So Africa is well capable, the teams are there, data is available all we are waiting for is that we need to build a strategic team with our northern partners so we can apply for funding to support you know some of this research to find solution Gamale, you agree with me that pandemic will not be sars cov2 infection will not be the last because there was sars in 2003 killed a lot of people were able to find an antidote exactly 10 years after, there was also MERS, Middle, um, Middle East Respiratory Viral Infection, also killed people. We were able to bring that under control. There was Ebola, and they're receiving SARS CoV 2. I can assure you, as climatic patterns are changing 
and as weather systems are also changing, new diseases are bound to appear. I speak as a microbiologist, but as we do, I want to believe that we must continue to enhance our research skills by making sure that we enhance the partners that we have. Think outside the box, be creative, and be able to find solutions so these microorganisms do not wipe us off the surface of the earth. Mm, thank you very much uh, for, uh, for these inputs. They are really powerful uh, points, and they also give hope as far as um, innovations and contributions from scientists in Africa um, can make to um, fighting um, this global pandemic. Uh, we are receiving a lot of interesting comments and questions from our audience. Um, there is a statement here from Dr. Sarah Suleiman who says that I think African brigades should be sent to the West to teach them how to control pandemics. And I mean, this statement is actually generating a lot of um, debates, their support and counterpoints here and there. I think that's really interesting. Please keep them coming. That's another question from uh, one of the our listeners, Dr. Cecil Naftali Moro Uma from Northwestern University. And um, I'll, I'll direct his question to Dr. Betty Kivumbi. He says that, what role do you think media echo chambers, especially from the West, shape the narratives when it comes to um, infodemics around COVID-19? What role do media echo chambers play? Well, I, I think uh, they play a very big role because we tend to gravitate towards what is coming out of the media. And we tend to believe them because at uh, most of the times, especially in Africa, we think the governments are not giving us the right information. So we tend to believe what the media is sharing uh, is, uh, out. So it plays a very big role. If, it, if it's negative, the, uh, the population is going to do, will go against the government policies. And if, if it's positive, they will uh, accept and um, adhere to the government policies. So... Uh, what I can say is that uh, the effect that it comes from the media on, on, uh, on uh, when we have epidemics is really can really be felt. We did uh, we felt that in Uganda at the beginning of uh, the outbreak of COVID because people thought that uh, the government was using COVID as an economic gain for economic gains, and the media was reporting that people were not uh, listening to what the government was saying until the government had to go through its communications uh, policies to try and reach out and even show what is really happening. So they really play a very, very great role and it depends on how the population, population responds to say whether it will be negative or, or positive. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so at this point, I have a general question for our panelists. And my question is that what are some of the most popular um, myths or false messages that have been going around in your respective countries uh, when it comes to this issue of COVID-19? What are some of the myths and misconceptions that you've had to fight in your line of work in your various countries when it comes to this COVID-19 pandemic? Yes, um, the question being directed to me. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, so if I really understood you well, you were trying to ask the kind of misconceptions and myths when it comes to the COVID-19 pandemic. Yes. Correct. Yes, um, the story in Ghana has been very interesting. There has been a lot of theories and uh, propaganda and whatever about COVID-19. Some people put out on the social media that COVID-19 was planned by a group of scientists from the West and their main intention was to wipe away black Africans from the surface of you know, Africa continent. Very interesting. Others were also of the view that um, COVID-19 was a hoax. It is a way of putting fear into people, so we slow down our economic activities. But be that is me, we have all experienced the negative effect of this COVID-19, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, with Ghana as a whole. 
you know, initially people didn't even believe that COVID-19 was that lethal in terms of its ability to even kill people. Not until we started reporting cases and then we started seeing social media videos from the West where people in Italy, unfortunately, were dying on the street and people in US were dying and then we were seeing the video that people began to realize that it was real. Um, all this has also affected the fight against COVID. And this is not common or this is not uncommon to COVID-19. Pandemic over the world has been linked up with a lot of myths and misbeliefs. And this has made the work of the public health expert very, very difficult. Because um, knowledge of a particular pandemic would give you the way without to be able to deal with it. Once you are aware that moving out unprotected as not wearing mask in your face or your mouth and they're not social distancing can harm you once you don't believe in it then it means you are likely to increase the rate of infection so the mathematicians will really understand this point from the r not the r not they define as the rate of new infections in a naive population so we are saying when your r not is high maybe two three four it means your, your rate of the infection is very high and all these things are affected by myth and misbelief and misbelief about the about the pandemic so in in ghana there were even people or well, even people who are who still believe that you know covid 19 is not even real and for those who believe some of the view that consuming large amount of alcohol can kill the virus Others are of the, of the view that once you don't stay in the larger cities, you are not likely to suffer the infection. Although it may be true to some extent because COVID-19 is um, an urban disease, not very much related to people in the rural communities to some extent. These were some of the perception that they have. There are some people who are even saying that once you suffer COVID-19, you are likely to be impotent. Some are saying once you suffer, once you suffer COVID-19, you will live with the virus for the rest of your life. These also attracted stigma that made the fight of COVID-19 in Ghana very difficult. But thanks to Ministry of Health of Ghana at the time, who I must say were on top of their game, they were able to do a detailed education, both on radio and TV, giving regular updates. Then also the president of the land also stepped in he was giving out regular updates how to make people feel that you know COVID was real and never a myth trying to correct some of the misconceptions and probably that is why the success story of COVID-19 in Ghana is a very good one and everybody is happy for the authorities okay thank you very much um Dr Kivumbi were there any um particular or unique myths or misconceptions um, coming out of um, Uganda around um, COVID-19? Oh, yes. In, in, in addition to what Dr. Samira said, uh, uh, in Uganda, people uh, felt or believed that COVID was for the rich folks in the cities because it was, at the beginning, it was only in the, in the returnees from abroad and people at the border. So those people are assumed to be rich and People thought it was for the rich folks. And there was also rumor going on that a, a concoction of local herbs could uh, prevent or give you uh, immune to COVID, uh, could give you immunity to COVID. And then uh, if you held your breath for 10 seconds, you would tell whether you have COVID or not. Um, if you drink alcohol, uh, like the genes, the strong, strong type that you cannot get a, a COVID, or if you sit in the sun for a particular length of hours, you will not get COVID. So we had a we had a number of uh, misinformation going around, and until the ministry came in, people were not really listening because they felt that uh, that uh, it was a hoax by the government. It was a hoax from Bill Gates uh, to, like Samuel said, uh, to cut down the African population. So. Uh, we, we, we had a, a good share uh, of uh, misinformation concerning COVID, but eventually it started going down when people started seeing 
uh, sick people or uh, hearing that people are dead. But even up today, people are, are still don't believe. When you say somebody died of COVID, they will still question whether they really died of COVID. So it's still ongoing, but it is not as much as it was at the beginning. So yes, we had a, a lot of misinformation circulating on social media. Mm. Thank you very yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, the discussion is still very much um, ongoing in our chat. Um, there's another comment. It blows my mind that people still don't believe it's real. It may be a survival mechanism or conspiracies. I'm still baffled at this stage that people still don't believe it. And we have Esther responding to this, um, saying that um, I believe that until a few months, most people, especially in Africa, had not met or heard anyone they know who have had any experience uh, with COVID-19. I think that um, that's a very, very salient point. Uh, my initial engagement with people uh, in Ghana around COVID had to do with the fact that, yes, they can't see it, they can't feel it, nobody they know has it, so it can't possibly be true until it, 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 it kept spreading and spreading. Um, it looks like the more it spread, the more people uh, began to believe. Um, there are so many questions here. I would encourage uh, people with questions to also use the raise hands feature so that um, we'll give them the opportunity to actually be part of the conversation and um, ask the questions directly. But here's a quick one from Charles. And uh, this question goes to Dr. Kivumbi and also Dr. JC, you can also um, weigh in. Um, the question, we've already addressed part of it, which has to do with the fact that Africa was projected to have a lot of deaths and a lot of infections around um, COVID-19. However, the, uh, this does not seem to be the case in the real world. So from your mathematical modeling point of view, um, why do you think um, Africa escaped or, or generally, why do you think Africa escaped this projection? Uh, well, what I think is that, uh, you know, Africa, we have a lot of challenges. We have a lot of infections. We have a lot of epidemics. Uh, this um, this is just my own opinion. I don't have any scientific proof to it, but I think that we have immunity. We ha Because of the way we live, because of our situations, we have a lot of sun, because of our behaviors. We we have some sense of uh, some level of immunity to many diseases. I know in Uganda we have had uh, that was some time back where there was some severe flu that killed people, but not as much as COVID has. And I have a feeling it is the same. Maybe this one is a bit worse, but it is the same. So I believe that because of the many diseases we have in Africa, maybe we are kind of immune because when you see our uh, the way we live. We don't have social distancing enough in in Western in Europe. You can have somebody living in the home alone in Africa. That is highly unlikely that you can live in a home alone. You have family, you have neighbors coming to your home un unannounced. So yes, they projected that because they know the way we live. But I believe that because of what uh, what we go through every day, we kind of have some we kind of have some immunity to certain diseases that can treat them severe more severe than us uh, because if uh, we, we had to say to face the same level of covid like they have yes their projections would have been true we would have been uh, right but based on the background mm -hmm. i believe there it has to be some level of immunity that we have Okay, thank you very much. Um, Dr. Fosu, quick uh, follow-up question. To what extent do you think that um, the kinds of interventions that have been put in place uh, by governments, uh, to what extent have these interventions influenced the kinds of numbers that we've seen on the continent? So, um, like I said earlier on, me and my respective team predicted that COVID-19 was not going to ravage Ghana, for that matter, West Africa and Africa in general, the way it has done to people in Europe and US. And these were my reasons. You know, I said earlier on that in any situation, when you look at global pandemic studies, when there is a pandemic such as COVID-19, in every hundred individual, between 90 to 92 of the people who will be infected will be mild or even asymptomatic. 
leaving about two to three percent who will be critically ill. Now, these are people who are mostly aged with underlying conditioning. When you look at the Africa demography, we have a life expectancy of about 50 52 compared to 80, 81, 82 to people in probably Canada, US of A, Spain, and Italy. And so the proportion of people within this age bracket who are likely to have some underlying conditions were greater. And so we were projecting that these people were going to be more hardly hit. Two, let's look at the ecology of the virus. Virus, as we have studied, we are all scientists. Virus, as we have studied, is very dangerous when it is within a living system, but after a living host. It is not as dangerous as it is. That is why, you know, people were not too much afraid of Ebola because Ebola, one, there was no contact and somebody was infected with the virus and the virus was in the sun. Within a short time, the virus died. We also predicted that with COVID-19, once the sun, the sun is shining brightly, if an infected person coughed or sneezed on a surface because of the high temperature of the sun, the virus was not likely to stay longer on that surface compared to in temperate regions where the weather was so cold, where the virus could stay on surfaces for much longer time. Three, you know, in Africa, especially people in the smaller towns, they normally work. You know, with COVID-19, the more active you are, the less likely of you having, you know, developing um, probably critical stage of the disease once you are infected because you are also mobile. Then um, me, my other co panelists Betty mentioned of vaccination. In Africa, you don't have a choice, especially in Ghana. In Ghana, we have an expanded program of immunization. Once you are born, whether you like it or yes, you are made to go through this rigid immunization program because our children are relatively seen not to be eating very well. And so they need to be, to be protected. All these and other factors aided in building our immune system. So the immune system in terms of COVID-19, which is caused by a virus, was stronger compared to people living in Europe and US. My brother, you agree with me that hardly will you see a typical African dying of flu. It never happened before. An African man is dead. What caused it? He died of the flu. It doesn't happen. But flu has been killing people in US of A and Europe, probably because of the weather. And then the climate that we have, countries lying at the middle of the equator, the sun is shining directly. There are lots of vitamin D. So instead of people, you know, buying vitamin D in Europe and other American states, we get it free of cost. And so by so doing, our fight against COVID-19 was going to be enhanced. And probably lastly, you know, nutrition. People who live in rural communities would normally would eat the greeny stuff, the greeny stuff, greeny vegetables, consuming many of them. Probably because those are the only food that are available to them. And all these go into enhance our immunity, especially against COVID-19. And so although Africa may not be very rich in terms of hospitals and institutions to deal with our health, we have been able to deal with the pandemic better than institutions who have more sophisticated health institutions. And thankfully, our health systems were not overwhelmed. As in Ghana, people are not even wearing the mask, although it's not a good idea. But you still realize that the rate of infection is not as high as we would have expected compared to people living in US of A and in Europe. Awesome. Um, yeah, I think your point really brings home um, the need for uh, more re investment into research um, when uh, we are looking at all the you know all the different areas that um, um, are possible uh, to build um, community um, resilience and um, i'd like to ask another question um, we are getting lots of questions from our listeners and um, this one from Grace Cargo says that, do you think there would be less misinformation if there was science communication in indigenous African languages? 
what's what in your view are the biggest barriers to making more um language accessible content so um we'll first go to dr kivumbi and then we'll come back to dr jc um i don't know if having messages in different languages would help because at times it depends on how the government relates to its people if people are against the government whether you change you translate a message in different languages people might still not believe it uh, currently in uganda we have a uh, elect uh, campaign presidential campaigns going on around and however much the government tries to inform the people to try and at least wear masks to try and limit the number of people to less than 200 in different uh, districts still you can find more than a thousand people at a rally and this has been reflected in the number of high cases we have received since the beginning of the elections so translating to local languages it, it might take more than that uh, it might take more than that to convince people uh, because we tend to think that something too good is too good to be true when a government tells you that you need to do this you need to do that for your own good you first look at how does the government benefit by caring about me in uganda the government gave free masks but people were going out with the masks in their pockets then they tried to arrest the people who didn't have masks still people didn't do, do not put on masks so it's it will take more than that to maybe until one of them said until i see and at somebody has died of covid i will not believe there is covid even with what is going on now so until perhaps it hits close to home maybe then they will be but at the moment they are starting to believe because we have a lot of death and most of them are abrupt from communities who were undetected and the mm. surveillance has reduced people no longer report who has it so it's going to take a lot of government engagement trying to government coming down to local communities to try mm. and convince people that this is actually a very big um a very we are in currently in uganda we are in phase four community transmissions they have to go back they have to go to the level ground they have to go to the communities and try to find ways to convince these people yes they can translate the messages but not when they are at the when they are not uh, broadcast on tv and expect everybody to listen to tv they will tell you they don't have tvs mm. so you have to go back down to the communities and engage on with people one on one if that's not if that does not happen uh what they predicted might happen later on not as soon as they predicted but it might happen later on mm. yeah thank you thank you for your for your, for your inputs um i tend to think that um the issue of local languages might have some uh, merit just in the sense that um um there are a lot of like technicalities um involved in something like uh, infections and when Dr. JC was making his presentation, he said a lot of things. He was trying to explain a lot of things. Um, even though he was speaking English, there was still like a lot of technicalities and all of that information and even the relevant parts do not get um, um, translated into local languages. And at the same time, uh, solely um, doing health education in say English or French, it might be difficult for that information to go to everybody in a country because not everybody has the capacity um, to speak those languages. First of all, assessing the information, even before believing the information or, um, uh, and really um, not just believing, but going beyond that to actually practice the behaviors that have been um, thought, uh, you know, comes into play. So it's it's quite complicated, but I think that the language may play a role. I, I don't know if um, Dr. JC has um, any strong opinion on this. Yes, to take it from where Dr. Kibumi left off. You know, um, communication in global health is very important. First of all, you must know your audience. So for instance, when I was speaking, I realized that, you know, this was the next Einstein forum, probably made up of scientists who may be thinking alike. Now, if you want to effect 
a behavior change, then it means the message itself, how it is delivered, when it is delivered, and who it is delivered to is very, very crucial. So for instance, um, you would want to deliver a message to change behavior. Don't forget, people were not used to wearing masks. All of a sudden, they are being instructed to wear masks. Now, once you put on a mask, there is a lot of discomfort when you try to breathe. You are not used to it. How can you convince such a person to keep on feeling the discomfort and making sure that you break the chain of transmission and spread it and stop the spread? And so you would want to, first of all, look at the different languages. But is it going to be feasible? So assuming you are in an institution or a country where you have about, say, 20, 30 different languages, are you going to be translating all these languages? Look at the cost. When it is done, how will the language be even be disseminated? So changing them to languages is good, but that alone is not the game changer. The game changer for me will be to modify the language in a format that can be accepted by all. So for instance, the person delivering the message is a person wearing no smart himself, is a person, you know, saying something and doing something in other space, maybe he's out there telling people to wear a mask, but he himself is seen in public addressing people without wearing the mask. It's going to make people adapting to this new change very, very difficult. And so I, I believe that, you know, change the language alone may not be the game changer, but how the message is crafted, who is delivering it, how is it delivered, when is it being delivered? And you know, the emotions and then the body language of the person delivering the message could mm -hmm. be the game changer. Okay, thank you very much. Um, there's another question that we have on the floor, uh, which is also a very important question. I think I'll address this to Dr. Um, Kivumbi first. And this question is coming from Rynell from McGill University. Um, it's a question about policy. So the question is that when a policy issuer is fighting the effects of misinformation, what are some of the metrics that they can use to assess the performance of their approaches in the African context? Now, uh, that's quite tricky because uh, that would be how do you quantify behavior? Because response to the policy is going to be behavioral change. Now, how can you quantify that? Maybe uh, if we take, if we look at COVID, you're going to look, uh, for example, in, in Uganda, when they tried to mitigate the misinformation, they definitely came up with policies. And then they would they see how people responded, how many cases that were, uh, were reported in preceding days. Uh, so maybe that would work. You have to look at, uh, you have to look at the outcome or the output after the policy comes out. Do you have less numbers? Do you have less cases like you did before? Do you have people talking about this policy within themselves or it is just one of those they brush aside and misinterpret it and pass, uh, pass on uh, misinformation? Because what is happening here, government comes up with a policy, it is countered with a fake letter from an, an anti-government or another pro-government person. So it it is really tricky because you you're trying to quantify behavior, but you can look at the output or the outcome after the policy. You can uh, first look at the objectives of your policy, then find out if uh, your objectives were first of all fulfilled and then what what are the results? Do you have, are they positive or negative? So if they are positive, then maybe you can, you can that is one way to assess that. Mm. Thank you very much. Um, I think that is a very deep and insightful um, answer to the question. Um, I'm just reading through the comments and discussions in the chat again, and it's it's really intriguing the kinds of uh, comments that are coming out. Uh, people are talking about uh, issues of perceptions about um, exploitation by government or other parties when it comes to dealing with COVID, and that's uh, also a reason that falls. Um, 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 misinformation or public unbelief in some of the aspects of the of, of the pandemic. So it just goes to show that apart from the core scientific issues, there are all kinds of cultural, um, social, 
and and and, and, and underlying con context that come into play uh, when, when it comes to Africa. So very interesting, very intriguing. Thank you very much for sharing your perspectives, and please do continue um, sharing your perspectives. Um, the next question that we have here, also addressing uh, misinformation and information gaps, um, focuses especially on vaccines. So this question is coming from Diane, who is uh, part of the industry uh, relations, uh, who is the industry relations manager at AIMS. And um, this question is particularly relevant um, as we are going towards um, having access to a vaccine and um, once and for all um, dealing with uh, the COVID-19 um, pandemic, big question on the minds of many people. And I think that Dr. JC can help us here. So Diane wants to understand how can information that is going around uh, relating to COVID-19 vaccine, how can that information be reliable? So how can the information regarding vaccines around COVID-19, um, how can we be sure that the information that's going around is reliable and how can um, communicators and policymakers deal with the, uh, this issue in an African context? Okay, so uh, um, she wants to know how we can package information regarding vaccines for COVID-19 so that it will be effective. Yes, so there is two prongs. One aspect is, yes, how do we sell the information? And then the second part is that how can we also deal with fake information regarding the vaccines from an African context? Um, effective. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes, please. Yes. So I, I would want to take it from malaria. Um, currently, I am part of a group. And then we are working on RT, SS, Mascaris, Malaria vaccine implementation. The program involves Ghana, Malawi, and Kenya. I happen to be one of the site PIs in Ghana. Now, at the start of the program, there were a lot of miscommunication and a lot of um, negative social media about this program. Apparently, vaccine is not new to us. I remember when we, or when we were growing up, there was issue of smallpox, chickenpox, and today, these are due to vaccines. And so I want to say it categorically that vaccines are good, it saves life. However, how can we communicate this information well so that people who need them will be the onus lies on the, implement, the implementers. Is it the Ministry of Health now going to do the implementation? They need to do intensive education. It's very, very important. Intensive education. Before a vaccine is introduced in any population, it has to go through four phases. We have phase zero, phase one, phase two, phase three, and even phase four before they start the introduction. Do people understand all these phases? In these phases, do people know what goes on with them there is issue of safety issues that needs to be handled by the fda are the fda making the right noise or doing the right education about the safety issues of some of these vaccines because believe it or not without a vaccine normal life back again i remember at the beginning of the year i purchased about four different tickets planning that i'll be traveling for conferences and meetings with COVID, none of them have been achieved. Businesses are folding up. Airlines are also folding up. The financial and economic burden is so huge. Now, the game changer is to getting a vaccine. Mm. Thank you very much, um, Dr. JC. Um, so uh, I would like to pull Esther, who has been a quiet uh, participant in the conversation in here to um, kind of just share some perspectives right. um, around around um, social media and um, information um, around um, COVID-19 um, and also just infections in general. Um, yeah, I know 
you're active on social media what would you say are some of the key observations you've made around information when it comes to COVID-19 in Africa? Um, thank you, Gameli, for putting me on the spot. <laughs> uh, but I, th I think in general, other than, um, than having research outcomes, for me, the first thing that, that I did observe is, um, is the fact that more people, especially young people, are looking to hear the right information from um, from doctors or healthcare professionals, people that are at the forefront of um, the the pandemic or dealing with uh, with patients um, on a daily basis. So you, I've seen just on my normal observation, I've seen most people who are um, epidemiologists, doctors. Uh, people who are on this task force that are that are really uh, trying to to cut COVID nineteen are the ones that are being followed more than um, than other politicians, I'll say. So yes, we are all looking out to see what are the new um, interesting or what are the new measures that countries are taking in terms of lockdown, the economy, and all that. But I think in terms of healthcare, health professionals have been um, most of the people that have been at the forefront. But one other interesting thing that I saw would be um, the general community of scientists really rattling around and providing um, insights best from that point of view. So everyone trying to explain what is COVID-19, where is it coming from, what are the numbers, what do numbers mean, um, what does this mean for people? And then everyone in their own sector, their own field, trying to see what can I do to help? Whether you're modeling, whether you're building um, in, insights or even um, uh, saying, okay, let me distill this information for people. Let me uh, create a solution. So I think that merging of how to explain information how to support healthcare professionals to to work better and easier for the on the on the pandemic i think for me that that was my observation and people um really trying to 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 get to to hear more words from healthcare professionals than mm -hmm. anyone else um in the in their communities awesome thank you very much um esther it's i mean it's really refreshing to hear these perspectives um mm -hmm. to counter uh, the usual narrative around social media being used for misinformation by the fact that it also gives the opportunity for the scientists for healthcare professionals and people that we typically don't hear from online to come online and share very useful information so we've all, we've come to the end of our session and um my last question um, to each of our speakers and indeed to all of us who are following and listening, uh, in case you are keen to make one quick intervention, it's around we as individuals, how do we assess information that we receive um, when it comes to infection projections or infection control? How do we assess information that we have received and to, to be able to determine quote unquote is believability how accurate or how correct that information is as on an individual basis are there best practices or things that we can do to be able to uh, determine how accurate or how correct information we, re we receive is so we'll go to dr jc and then we come to dr kivumbi well um i would look at the source when i i receive a whatsapp message mm -hmm. I, and sometimes most of it is edited and um uh, the, uh, is it photoshopped? I have to go to the website that is being quoted uh, to see if that information is there. There was a false information that was going around uh, Uganda apparently by WHO. So I had to go to the website to look to see whether that information was actual there and it wasn't. So I would look at, I would go to the website. And if the uh, information is not from WHO, CDC, those big, big, big uh, organizations that uh, inform uh, the general public, I wouldn't really uh, believe it until 
it has been approved by uh, one of those big organizations so i would find i would look at the source where the, uh, that information is coming coming from or I, or I would confirm that it is actually from there or not thank you very much i think these are some really handy and uh, valuable tips that we can all go home with um, a very informative session from our two uh, speakers dr samuel fusu jc who is the head of basic and applied biology at the University of Energy and Natural Resources in Sunyani, Ghana. And we've also had Dr. Betty Kivumbi, who is a senior lecturer in, at the Department of Mathematics at Makerere University in Kampala, Uganda. Uh, we've had lots of contributions from contributors and participants from around the world. We've had Esther Kunda, who is with the Policy Innovation and Community of Scientists. She's the manager at Next Einstein Forum, um, also sharing brilliant perspectives on this topic. Myself, I'm Gamalia Jao from Just One Giant Lab. Um, we've explored the biology of infections. We've explored modeling. We've explored science communication in the African context as far as this um, topic is concerned. I'd like to say thank you very much to everybody for participating in the session and for your wonderful contributions. And um, I hope you continue to enjoy the, the conference as we exchange online. Thank you and goodbye.